We've mm-hmm. just opened the restaurant. Yeah. The customers are coming, mm-hmm. but they're giving us very bad reviews. And uh, some of them are even saying, don't go to this restaurant. So it was very scary because uh, it was almost a life's investment for me that I had put in. Unless you innovate, unless you give something new to the customer, mm. uh, sooner or later you'll be dead. Interesting. The gratification and the satisfaction that you create get by creating something of your own is unparalleled. True. Provided mm. it gives you enough to run your family. True. Right? Otherwise it's a struggle. Good evening and welcome to the Late Night Business. My name is Ian Dennis and tonight we have a very interesting show lined up because you're going to be addressing a very interesting subject, the restaurant business. How exactly is it? How is it someone supposed to be successful at it? And the guest I have tonight is someone who's actually been at it for almost the last, almost a decade, who's going to be sharing with us the journey. Before I get to introduce the guest that you have tonight, I'd like to let you know that you're here at the Capital Club, the place you need to be as an entrepreneur, because at the Capital Club, you have a wide access to so many different particular amenities, such as the room that you are in, there's the restaurant, there's the gym, there's the spa, and so much more. And also, as I'll be reminding you, week in, week in, week, we have the Business Conquest Masterclass happening on the 4th of April, whereby you'll be having Michael Joseph share his tip on how exactly he builds Safaricom from scratch. What exactly can you learn from his particular success? So the gentleman I'm speaking about is Mr. Rajiv Sigal. Hope I got it right. He's the appropriator behind Daba Restaurant, Library Restaurant, and Mayura Restaurant. I've actually hosted him in my previous show called The Business Conquest. I'm called The Business Coach. And we had such an interesting conversation. And I thought, why not bring him here to have an extensive conversa- conversation around his journey. Mr. Rajiv, thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Ian, for calling me again. And uh, it's a pleasure. We met before COVID. <laughs> yes, it almost it seems, looks like a lifetime. Yes, it seems like a lifetime. It was such a while ago. But nice to see you survived it. Well, uh, I think by God's grace, we've survived it mm-hmm. as well as now we are thriving. So um, I think uh, things have worked out well. Interesting. The first question I like starting all my interviews. What exactly are you most grateful for today? What exactly am I? Grateful for today. Oh, well, uh, you answered it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's for surviving through the possibly the toughest period of the last hundred years. Mm-hmm. And particularly for the industry and business that I am in. Mm-hmm. Uh, COVID almost killed uh, our walk-ins. Mm-hmm. So we really did not have a backup strategy as an industry, as a company to fall back upon. But I think uh, the quick learnings uh, some support from the team as well as uh, you know a little bit of initiatives taken on early by the government mm-hmm. well um, it's a combination of events but thankfully we survived and I think that made us realize the power of resilience mm-hmm. that if you can survive this phase mm-hmm. then you could do almost anything interesting what did that particular period of uncertainty teach you or what are the lessons that you actually gained from that particular period I think uh, In the hindsight, if I look back, Mm -hmm. um, what COVID taught us was that be prepared for the worst. And I think sometimes what we do as businesses is do not have a backup plan or we do not build enough reservoir or capital for Mm -hmm. us to take it through um, through the lean phases. Um, It's, you know, like stock markets, you know, Mm -hmm. when the market is bullish, everything seems hunky-dory, you're buying stocks, Mm -hmm. you're and you're never really planning for a day when the market will turn upside down. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened during the COVID. Mm. So, uh, you know, in, in the food industry and in the, in the hospitality industry, mm-hmm. when uh, the prime source of your revenue dries up, mm. then you really have to think on your feet mm-hmm. as to what is it that you want to do now. And I think a couple of things helped us. One was, of course, by virtue of, and I can take a little bit of credit for that by mm. working in large corporates, there was a little bit of an exposure to how do you handle crisis because that's something which happens almost on a daily basis in any large company and therefore to an extent you are exposed to that and then more importantly i think what the exposure teaches you is financial prudence and if you are disciplined enough and uh, you have that financial prudence to say uh, yes there is a certain bit of capital that you might need at any time Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that came handy during COVID. Interesting. And it seems so far away uh, when this happens almost four years back. And I'm sure probably by now there's so many things that have actually changed. But what maybe elements of policies that you've actually implemented then in in regards to that particular season? Because I'm sure as Kenyans, just as human beings, once you've gone through a hard period, we tend to forget it. 
and get back to revert to normal because yes. now things are normal. What are some of the policies or maybe measures you've actually put in your business right now in uh, what's it called cognizant of what exactly happened? I think the biggest learning was and biggest uh, uh, thing that we wanted to implement was that there should always be a dependence on more than one revenue stream. So if let's say a la carte is your basic business, mm -hmm. then you do need to take measures to start focusing on takeaways and deliveries. Mm. So therefore that is a little bit of a risk diversification that you can do in your own business. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what COVID taught us that mm. if you do not have walk-in customers, how do you take the customers, uh, how do you take the deliveries to the customer's mm. home? Mm. But that is only the tactical aspect. Mm. I think the more important thing to understand here is that and what I gained from that is that there is a lot of technology and digital play mm -hmm. when it comes to innovations like these. Mm -hmm. And I think Kenya by far is still a long way in going, getting into the spaces where other countries and other businesses in other countries are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say a simple thing like deliveries. Now mm -hmm. today our sole banking or majority of the banking is on the likes of Bolts and Jumias and Uber Eats of the world. Mm -hmm. but uh, there is certainly a big scope of widening this mm. and there is certainly a big role of technology to be able to put that app in the hands of people where they can simply select the restaurant of their choice mm. and order either directly or even you know stretch your imagination a little more and and say why can't we put let's say kiosks in in places where the customer is mm. instead of the customer coming to the restaurant yeah. you just put in a coin or some money or a few shillings mm. and and get the get your delivery of your choice from the kiosks mm. now those are the things that i haven't seen much in this country but i'm sure they will evolve as as we go by interesting so let me just take you back um because i know you started on from <laughs> you started high but let me just take you back and just trying to understand your journey you've grown up in india Yes, I've had various guests who are what's it called also also grown up in India, and they tell me how competitive India is. Just as a student, before even getting to business, how was your upbringing, and how competitive was it? Well, um, uh, let me start from the upbringing. Both mm. my parents were government servants, so there was no real exposure to any business ah, of any kind. So after I did my yeah. uh, engineering and my mm. masters, mm -hmm. uh, the natural progression was to work in large corporates, which mm -hmm. is what I did for almost 18 years of my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. So I worked with uh, my large corporations like BNP Paribas mm -hmm. and uh, Bank of America, and mm -hmm. then Kotak, and then the last assignment was uh, with Airtel, which mm -hmm. brought me to Africa in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, um, so whilst personally I did not have any business exposure, uh, but in terms of uh, the fact that I was born and brought up in Delhi and I've uh, travelled extensively in India, mm -hmm. uh, you are right and my understanding now is much uh, better. Mm -hmm. India is a very competitive market mm -hmm. and uh, more so because of a couple of things which, which I can understand and relate to. Mm -hmm. One, of course, it's a large growing population, mm. right? And therefore, the uh, the GDP is growing, the middle income, uh, average income of the household is growing, and mm. therefore, the aspirations are growing. Mm. Second is, it's not restricted to Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, Bangalore of the world. Mm -hmm. The tier two cities uh, are the ones which are really progressing yeah. and increasing faster. Mm -hmm. And third, of course, is the fact that uh, Indians by nature are... Uh, uh, a little more entrepreneurial yeah. and of course uh, the understanding of the business and what flows into it is ingrained somewhere in the DNA. Mm -hmm. Probably one reason why you see most of the uh, world corporations are headed by people yeah. of Indian origin. Uh -huh. So uh, so yes, it's competitive mm -hmm. but if you ask me if I would be comfortable doing business there, uh -huh. uh, I think my answer would be no. Why? <laughs> uh, well, uh, to the extent we've answered that, yes. because it is so competitive, uh, uh, it requires a different level of capital mm -hmm. and a different skill set mm -hmm. to survive in such a competitive environment because there are big sharks mm. uh, and of course which are backed by a lot of FDIs and funding. Mm. So for you to be able to compete on that landscape, mm -hmm. you really have to have a business which you can't do on your own capital, then mm. you have to have a leverage. Mm -hmm. And I think for that, it's a little bit of a cash 22 mm. because you need to scale up a bit before yeah. you get the FDI mm -hmm. and you can't scale up unless you get the funding and the capital. So it's a little tricky market. So in a nutshell, uh, I'm glad I'm in this country. Interesting. And 
uh, what's it called? You've mentioned about your corporate journey. You've had such an interesting corporate journey. Maybe you can just take us through that particular journey and how exactly it has transpired through the years. Uh, as I said, uh, after my engineering and masters, I uh, I had an opportunity to work with large companies, mm -hmm. and uh, the exposure that I have been fortunately had uh, mm -hmm. was so multifaceted mm -hmm. that uh, it. Uh, now I think it was destined for me to do my own business because now I can fall back upon my experiences and learnings yeah. of my corporate life. Yeah. So I've had uh, exposures to the product development, mm -hmm. the sales and marketing, yeah. uh, and um, and some bit of uh, you know technical uh, uh, exposure. All of that helps you when you are you know starting your own business, mm -hmm. however big or small that might be, because yeah. then uh, from a uh, CEO to the peon, mm -hmm. you really, you know, everything or a part of everything yourself. Mm -hmm. Ah, interesting. And how was it called? From your particular corporate experience, what would you see were the biggest takeouts out of it? Because you've been in various particular industries, you mentioned banking and also telecommunication. What are the biggest takeouts from the corporate experience uh, you had that you actually took to your entrepreneurship experience? So let me, let me try and relate to uh, how my business has linked back to the exposure and what I learned. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, start with the easiest mm -hmm. sales, mm -hmm. right? Now, the discipline of sales mm -hmm. is such that you have to continuously knock on a door before it opens, mm -hmm. right? You cannot give up. Yeah. And I think that is something which has, you know, since either I was ingrained in me and through that exposure, mm -hmm. the, the fact is that whenever you open doing something new, mm -hmm. The customer does not accept you immediately. Yeah, yeah. It takes a lot of time and effort to convince the customers to mm. come in and uh, experience. Mm. Um, let me give you a small example. Mm. Right, we had a uh, we we've been selling chicken tikkas for so long. Right, chicken tikka is a staple uh, diet in any Indian yeah. uh, uh, restaurant. It's my favorite, actually. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure, and, and that's that's something which people relate to, which is why I'm giving yeah, that yeah. example. Uh -huh. Now, uh, we wanted to try various uh, variations, mm -hmm. right? And we said, what is it the we could do or innovate on that? Mm -hmm. So we said, uh, let's try a um, old monk chicken, mm -hmm. right? So we'll, or a Jack Daniel chicken. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll marinate it on Jack Daniels. in Jack Daniels yeah. or, or, uh, or old monk. Mm -hmm. And then we do it on the skewers in clay oven mm -hmm. and present it with a shot of a JD, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was various questions. Mm -hmm. The acceptability was zero. Mm -hmm. uh, people couldn't understand uh, how is it that the chicken tikka is tasting a little bitter than it should be mm -hmm. because there's a certain taste that you're used to mm -hmm. a chicken tikka. So I think uh, uh, the choice was to take it off the menu, which was easiest. Mm -hmm. But intuitively, we knew that there is something unique about the product because mm -hmm. Kenyans love chicken mm -hmm. and they love their drink with yeah, the chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it made eminent sense to club the two yeah. and we said, uh, you know, I think uh, we need to change our communication strategy a mm -hmm. little bit mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then we did that. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually put it in the face, I put a bottle right in front of the chicken tikka yeah. so that people understand what it is. Uh -huh. We educated them a little, we get, created reels and videos. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that perseverance paid off. Mm -hmm. So now it's one of the largest selling items on the menu. Interesting. So therefore, uh, as I said, so, you know, when it comes to sales, mm -hmm. you really have to continue to knock the door of the customers mm -hmm. before it opens for you. Uh, likewise, uh, product development. Mm -hmm. When you're designing a menu, you could take the easier route of a me too menu, mm -hmm. or you could say, what is it that you would eventually get known for? Mm -hmm. And if you are an Indian restaurant, then you have to uh, bank upon a few things that would, you know, you would innovate around your own menu and your own products. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, we always try and do, launch a new product every 15 days or a month. And, uh, and give that novelty factors to the customers mm -hmm. for them to be able to come to your restaurant again and again. Mm -hmm. Because the other learning also mm -hmm. is that this is a, a business of diminishing returns mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, when you open a new restaurant, people will give you a chance and they will yeah. explore you. Mm -hmm. But for them to be able to come again and again, mm -hmm. you have to be true to the value that you give to them. Mm -hmm. 
and therefore you have to give them something new every time hmm. otherwise you know the customer loyalties are limited today hmm. there are half a dozen other restaurants that the yeah. customers can go to mm -hmm. so i think one of the learnings also is which i picked up from again my corporate exposure is that unless you innovate unless you give something new to the customer hmm. uh, sooner or later you'll be dead interesting and at what particular point did you make that particular decision to move away from corporate now to get into entrepreneurship what exactly triggered that because you've been there for years what exactly made you make this final leap uh, so as i said uh, um airtel brought me to africa mm -hmm. and uh, after having uh, been in the nigerian market and kenyan market mm -hmm. uh so there are only two options uh, a uh, relatively senior corporate professional has in any large company mm -hmm. right one is you break through the glass ceiling and then you uh, you know have a hockey stick kind of a, a exponential growth within mm -hmm. the corporate or mm -hmm. some other corporate yeah else once you reach a certain stagnation level mm -hmm. then you start thinking what more that you could do yeah. and that bug was there in me somewhere to say uh yes i think there is something more that you know i should explore mm -hmm. but what was that something more was always a question mark because mm -hmm. when you when you working with large corporates the cushion uh, and the cocoon is such that there is a lot of support system which is naturally built up you mm -hmm. know you get salaries at the end of the month mm -hmm. and therefore uh, it it becomes a little bit of a comfort zone for you mm -hmm. but uh, what is it that you want to do is the biggest question mm -hmm. So um so we toyed with various ideas mm -hmm. in fact uh, uh I um uh, I explored various options before we settled on the hospitality business mm -hmm. and um and one of the things which worked in my favor was that in India we had a little bit of exposure to this food business because I had a few uh, uh, two food outlets yeah. uh, which I was not directly managing but my brother was and I had a little exposure to that business and we thought let's do something around this mm -hmm. and see if it works mm -hmm. and the downside is if it doesn't work mm -hmm. then there's always that option of going back to india <laughs> uh, but then fortunately yeah. things things turned out well interesting and oh, was it called so what was your first brand and how did you go about setting it up because you mentioned that it was more about experimenting to see if it's going to work and then see if it's going to build it what take me just to that particular phase so it was interesting because the um i did not know anything about this business mm -hmm. when i started all right and uh, sometimes um the ignorance is bliss as they say yeah, yeah ignorance is uh, bliss <laughs> and it i think worked out yeah. well in my favor uh -huh. because uh when i was trying to open my restaurant of course you know when intuitively westlands is the 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 manhattan of kenya mm -hmm. and therefore the first choice is obviously you know this location yeah but uh, i we, we we worked around and i couldn't find anything which was within budget etc etc so um so the next uh, available option which we were getting was at the hub mall in karen which was being built up mm -hmm. now i really didn't know that that's really not an area which is a uh, so called indian uh, population infested area yeah uh, and secondly uh, when i approached the mall management they refused because i did not have any exposure Uh, oh. to this business right. so they said we would not be able to give you a space because you're not a known brand hmm. and it's a new business for you so they refused so they refused uh but uh, i think and and that's another learning that i could provide whatever little bit to your viewers yeah. is that i could have easily given up then hmm. and said okay i'll wait till i you get another good. place in yeah. westlands or etc uh but i don't know for whatever reason i did not then i said okay if the mall management is refusing because i am not a known brand hmm. or i don't have an exposure hmm. why don't i partner with someone who has an exposure ah. so then i called up someone uh, one of my friends in delhi and hmm. he co came over hmm. so he was already running restaurants in delhi so hmm. he had a big exposure hmm. he came over we created a big presentation etc and hmm. then i went back to the mall management and did a presentation again hmm. along with my Uh, yeah, friend. this friend who yeah. knew about the business mm -hmm. and obviously they were convinced that uh, you know there is somebody backing this project yeah. who understands this business etc etc so so uh, they agreed to the place uh, and uh, and we and we created the first restaurant and again because i did not know anything about this business i did not realize that 
opening a restaurant in December hmm. is a wrong month to open. Why? Uh, I didn't know that. Now I know. So <laughs> tell me, uh, it's supposed to be the right month. Everybody's eating out, or what exactly? See, because you are new. Yeah. You're the first uh, restaurant. Mm-hmm. You are bound to have teething problems, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, no restaurant is perfect. Mm-hmm. And when you have the busiest month of the year, mm-hmm. all you're doing is spoiling your reputation, nothing else, <laughs> right? And what happened was we opened in December, uh-huh. and little did I realize that. Uh, not having an Indian restaurant in that area yeah. because nobody wanted to go there and yeah. in Habib, everybody wanted to be in Westlands mm-hmm. was actually a blessing in disguise again because uh, people wanted Indian food there yeah. was no other option so there were literally queues outside my restaurant when we opened and then you and ruined as it a or? result uh, <laughs> uh, we couldn't manage we fell through uh-huh. right and I still remember Ian, it's very interesting yeah uh, I had my executive chef two of them from India mm-hmm. that I had called yeah uh, because I was very clear that if you want to make it a success then you need an Indian touch in mm-hmm. the in the food mm-hmm. so uh, so we uh, uh, my executive chef yeah. it was the Christmas day yeah. right 25th of December mm-hmm. and of course the busiest day yeah. of the year one of the busiest mm-hmm. days and 26th morning mm-hmm. I get a news that he's already taken a flight back to India. Uh, so overnight, Why? after closing, Why? he just couldn't take it. Right? The demand was too much. The demand was too much. The work was load was too much. It was like I and, can't take um, it anymore. <laughs> and maybe he said because I I didn't interact with him after that, but maybe he thought it's too much. Uh-huh. So be that as it may, um, you know, to cut the long story short, yeah. Um, the overnight, my executive chef disappeared. Uh-huh. Uh, I did not have a chef for again. The new year was approaching, yeah, so it was a again chef. a busy, busy period. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so the fact is that, and we had terrible reviews, uh-huh. you know, uh, of the restaurant. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I told Rekha, my wife, I said we are doomed. You know, the <laughs> uh, the good part is there are customers who want to come in, the bad but part everybody who want who comes in then does not come back. Either it takes. You know, along to serve the food, uh-huh. or some order is messed up, etc., etc., yeah. and so all of those things happen. Interesting. So but we'll we'll pause on that. Other particular points that you can take a short commercial break, and then we'll be back. So we're taking a flight like the executive chef back to India, and then we'll see if we're going to come back after the break. Welcome back to the show. Before we went on a break, Mr. Rajiv was just taking us through that particular layer of stories uh, as to how exactly you opened the restaurant on Christmas today. The load was too much. So much that was actually happening that his executive chef had to leave the country. How did you deal with that? Well, it was a disaster then uh-huh. because the customers were pouring in. We didn't know how to handle. Mm-hmm. And at that point in time, I thought, you know, we are dead on arrival. We've mm-hmm. just opened the restaurant. Yeah. The customers are coming, mm-hmm. but they're giving us very bad reviews. And uh, some of them are even saying, "Don't go to this restaurant." Mm. So, um, so it was very scary because uh, it was almost a life's investment for me that I had put in. Oh, so you taken all your savings to push it on the business. That's right. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and then yeah, everything just crumbling down. We uh, yeah, so not so much in terms of revenues because the customers were still flowing in. Yeah. But the reviews were so scary that uh, I wasn't sure that people would come back. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then. Um, uh, somehow the New Year's passed, the 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 busy period passed, and How then did you I. that first of all? Your executive chef was not there. Did you step in? But you told me you don't don't know anything about. Well, this. Uh, how did you go about that? I think uh, again, uh, you could relate it to the learnings in the business. Mm-hmm. That if you are the founder CEO, mm-hmm. you know there is no difference between a peon and a CEO when yeah. you're running your own business, mm-hmm. right? So I was literally running around, you know, be taking orders, or. You know, purchasing, going to Carrefour or uh, Nakumat at that time to to get the shortfalls uh, in, mm-hmm. um, punching as a cashier on the system. So there were various roles that I was playing at that time just to tide over the crisis somehow. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, uh, Rekha, my wife, was in the kitchen most of the time. Oh. Um, you know, either telling the chefs what to do mm-hmm. or uh, simply arranging the pickups with the waiters, etc. So. 
um, so I think the, the the great learning there is mm. that uh, you really do not have a job role defined as it is in large corporates mm. um, and uh, you know it's it's like a big canvas yeah. uh, a large corporate already gives you a canvas with a painting yeah. or the outline drawn true, true. and what you get is a section to paint and mm. then the question is how well can you paint, paint in that yeah. Uh, in your own business, the canvas is yours. So mm. right from the outlining, the picturing, even selling the canvas, everything you have to do yourself. So we uh, somehow, you know, I, I really don't know how uh, and I don't want to go back and even remember. <laughs> but all I know is it was traumatic <laughs> and, uh, and it was scary more than traumatic. I was uh -huh. very scared that, uh -huh. you know, uh, we are new in the business and this is what has happened. So again, uh, there were two choices mm -hmm. you know one is to just sit down and give up and say oh god what's happened mm -hmm. the second is to figure out okay this has happened mm -hmm. now what do i do mm -hmm. and i think we uh, we because there was no plan b because we had put in the life savings into the restaurant mm -hmm. there was no option for us but to Make you know work. get up and and run somehow again so then i went to india uh, took a break for about a week Mm -hmm. Quickly interviewed a few chefs, brought in a new team, mm -hmm. brought in, uh, a, looked at all the reviews that we had, mm -hmm. responded to each one of them, explaining the situation, mm -hmm. uh, reached out to as many customers as we could, etc., etc. So it took us three months to put our house in order. Yeah. And uh, but fortunately, after three months, since we realized quickly what went wrong, because everything possibly that could go wrong went wrong went in wrong, December. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we, uh, we, uh, we realized what went wrong, we put these things in place, called a new chef uh, uh, on an emergency from India. Yeah. And uh, then I think after three months is what the, the, we got a breather. Interesting. From this particular experience that you mentioned, your first time opening this restaurant, everything that could go wrong went wrong. It's an experience that also most restaurants, especially in the city, uh, experience. You see a restaurant here today, uh, opened after a few months under new management so there's a new management syndrome how can that be solved from your experience having gone through this particular rough patch well ian to be honest whether it's the old management or the new management mm. you got to have basics right mm. right and if you have your basics right there yeah. will not be any need for a new management mm -hmm. because you'll be doing well yeah and those are uh, those are the things which have helped us in good stride and mm -hmm. which is why we've been able to open six restaurants in six years. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we realized early in the journey of an entrepreneurship mm -hmm. that your discipline is, is clearly very important. And when I say discipline, it doesn't only mean financial discipline. Mm -hmm. The fact is that you have to balance all the moving parts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the business. Mm -hmm. You have to have your uh, basics right, of mm -hmm. course, the food quality, mm -hmm. the ambience, mm -hmm. the service, those are the basic pillars, you've mm -hmm. got to get them right. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, the softer aspects mm -hmm. of how you talk to your employees, mm -hmm. you know, how do your employees see you, mm -hmm. um, how do you put the uh, practices uh, or the SOPs as we call them mm -hmm. in place, mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with your vendors, mm -hmm. you know, how uh, early can you give them uh, you know their dues so mm -hmm. that they don't run into shortfalls mm -hmm. so those are the things that we we ensure that you know uh, we we put in place mm -hmm. uh, our suppliers vendors have been happy because we make sure that the payment is given to them on time mm -hmm. uh, and of course uh, you cannot cheat the customer in any way mm -hmm. i think that's the cardinal rule mm -hmm. you have to be true to the value that you give them mm -hmm. Even if you're, if you're a five-star restaurant, mm. right, with five-star pricing, yeah. then give them luxury. Mm. That's what they're paying you for. Mm. If you are a middle segment restaurant and, you know, customer is seeking value for money, mm. give them that because mm. that is what they're seeking. Mm. You cannot, you know, be pretentious in this business. Mm. You cannot say, I am mid-level business, mm. you know but I will have a five-star pricing. Yeah. It doesn't work. Mm. And if you have a five-star pricing, you cannot be, uh, uh, you know, your presentation and your cannot, food yeah. and the quality cannot be a roadside kebanda. Mm -hmm. So therefore, speak to your customer, understand your target audience yeah. uh -huh. and give them what they want, mm -hmm. then you're good. Maybe. The moment you do a mismatch, start yeah. becoming pretentious in this business, mm -hmm. uh, start taking the customer for granted and mm -hmm. for a ride, mm -hmm. 
uh, the customer is not going to forgive you. Interesting. Uh, you've mentioned that you, in the last six years, you managed to open a restaurant from probably every six, uh, every, every year. How is that possible? How have you made that particular possible, making this particular growth, which is unusual? Because most people probably stay in one restaurant for quite a number of years before you expand one by one. How have you made that possible? Well, it wasn't conscious when, when this happened. But uh, it's easier to connect the dots in the hindsight. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting again, mm -hmm. um, because when I opened the first one in Hub, I have taken you through the story of yes. how that happened, right? Yeah. Uh, but I also told you that I always wanted to start from Westlands because mm. Westlands is really the uh, Connaught place of Delhi or Manhattan of New York. Yeah. Uh, and when uh, there was an opportunity here, uh, which uh, uh, which was with the Kenya Railways building, mm. uh, it was right in the middle of Westlands and I was uh, uh, again wanting that space which was not available because it was leased out to somebody else mm. and that guy pulled out. So it was a little bit of destiny as well. Wow. And therefore we got that space. Mm -hmm. And when I got that space next year, I was very clear that if we don't take it this one, mm -hmm. we're not going to get that. Mm -hmm. And by then we, re uh, we, we had realized that location matters a lot. Mm -hmm. And therefore when that space became available, uh, we really didn't have much of a choice because intuitively that was the right place mm -hmm. and therefore we went ahead for mm -hmm. it, which is why it happened so, so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, then of course the third one happened because the SGR was getting made and uh, uh, and because uh, the, there was an opportunity to mm -hmm. create something nice within yeah. the SGRs, so we could do that in both the terminals. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it, it just happened that the opportunities came by mm -hmm. or the, let me say the right opportunities came by and we were able to just uh, leverage them at the right time. Interesting. And you've mentioned something about location, which is very, very key. If you're what is your, what's it called, the key checkpoints when you're looking for any particular location? What do you look at before settling for a particular location? Uh, so it depends on, let's say, uh, country to country. Mm -hmm. But let me talk of Kenya, mm -hmm. yes. uh, you know, which is where we operate. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there are a couple of key factors that anyone should look at. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what my checkpoints are. Mm -hmm. One, of course, is that the weather of Nairobi mm -hmm. or Kenya at large, is actually a paradise as compared to most other countries mm -hmm. because this is one country or one city yeah. where you can use the outside terrace for almost mm. throughout the year. <laughs> true, I mean, true. you know, yeah. uh, unlike a, a Dubai or an India where mm. you, if you have a terrace, then mm. you can't use it for half the year. Mm. Right? So therefore, um, clearly, and that's one reason why people love sitting out. So to me, uh, if you're building a nice restaurant, then the uh, it should have an indoor and outdoor. So right. that's the first checkpoint for mm -hmm. me. Second, of course, is you look at what's your target audience and what's your footfall going to be. Yeah. Um, then um, so you realize that um, this hospitality business mm -hmm. is dependent on uh, tourists as much as it is on the native population. Mm -hmm. So if you have the right mix of the two, mm -hmm. uh, then I think that's a second checkpoint that mm -hmm. I have. And third, of course, is commercials. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot get into a, uh, if you're building a value restaurant that we are, yeah. then I cannot be inside a five star hotel. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have to look at something which is more relatable to the customers yeah. and more relatable to our target audience. Interesting. And also something interesting. So you started off with Mayura, but you sort of like uh, created other brands, this Daba, this library. Yes. Why did you decide to diversify the, the brands? as well compared to just building one particular brand? What is the decision behind that? Okay, so uh, Mayura is a Indian fine dining restaurant. Mm -hmm. So I think we were very clear on the concept and mm -hmm. what it's conveying and what our target market is and yeah. what the menu should be. And I think it's very easy for me to explain what Mayura is. Yes. Um, the second brand which came in is the library. Mayura is Indian? Mayura is Indian. What does it mean? So Mayura actually means uh, uh, peacock. Peacock. Uh, in Indian uh, ah, language and right. uh, we chose peacock uh, for a few reasons mm -hmm. uh, one of course is peacock is the most colorful bird mm -hmm. right that nature has produced and we mm -hmm. wanted to create something colorful and vibrant mm -hmm. which is why all our interiors speak to uh, ah. a peacock theme yeah. uh, which is very colorful and vibrant mm -hmm. so that was one and second of course peacock holds a uh, a very special place in Hindu mythology. Uh, mm -hmm. Lord Krishna used to have a peacock feather with him mm -hmm. all the time. So there is certain bit of um, spiritual. Uh, a spiritual yeah. or a mythological angle to right. it. Uh -huh. um, and uh, and third, we just like the name Mayura. Yeah, so, it sounds good. <laughs> uh, so uh, 
So I think uh, we chose that for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. So once Mayura was done, mm -hmm. uh, I think there was an opportunity to create a... Uh, so we always wanted to create a coffee shop, mm -hmm. right? But then we said there is art cafes and Java mm -hmm. houses of the world which are so prevalent and so big. Yeah. Uh, does it make any sense to open another, you know, me too coffee shop? Mm -hmm. So we said no. The answer is no. So mm -hmm. uh, the thought was, okay, so if that is the genre that you want to get into, mm -hmm. uh, what is the differentiation you can create? Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, if everyone is running after coffee mm -hmm. and we want to be in this genre, then why don't we talk about tea, mm -hmm. right? And when you talk about tea, mm. what does the tea get complemented with? Books, mm. right? So books and tea, uh, we thought was a great uh, combination right. to, uh, to have someone like uh, a young person or a lady wanting to come and just have a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is how the name library came. Mm -hmm. Because we said uh, we actually have a library inside mm. the, the library. tea shop or the yeah. coffee shop as mm -hmm. you may call it. Which is why the name is library. So. Mm -hmm. The idea was to create an actual library. Mm -hmm. So most of the times when you go to, let's say, central London or other places, you see these bookshops, the large bookshops, they have a small coffee shop in the, mm -hmm. in the middle somewhere. Mm -hmm. We said we'll reverse that. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a fairly big tea coffee shop with a small library in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think that concept worked well because uh, we see now a lot of uh, young girls who want to spend time on their own coming, taking off their slippers, we have those reading pods created, yeah. so just pick up a book, have your tea and read a pod. And then we also have created those uh, nice individual pods mm. because we started during COVID and yes. we realized that isolation is the key. Yeah. And that's become very popular now, people hire it for a day and they want to do their interviews or they want mm. to talk to a few people, etc. So they're, they're, it's their own private space. Interesting. And then Dhaba? So Dhaba is interesting because uh, after having done the Indian cuisine, yeah. Uh, which is most familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very clear that I will not get into something which is an unfamiliar territory. Mm -hmm. So I will not open a uh, Italian restaurant or a Ethiopian restaurant or, or, <laughs> or any of that. Or a Nigerian one. <laughs> or a Nigerian one for that matter. So uh, I wanted to be true to my roots. Mm -hmm. But there was a Mayura. Mm -hmm. So then the thought was, what is it that you could do differently mm -hmm. and be a big differentiator? Mm -hmm. And since that was the last project which I did, mm -hmm. Uh, there was a lot of learning behind what went wrong during mm -hmm. Mayura mm -hmm. or library and what is it that we could correct here. Mm -hmm. And I think the few things were very clear. One, of course, uh, you have to give a great food. I mm -hmm. think that's a given. Yeah. But beyond that, um, I come from Delhi and Punjab or the Northern Indian belt. And mm -hmm. for the people who understand India a little bit, mm -hmm. India is a unique country because every state or every corner of India, you will have a completely different cuisine. Yeah. So whilst we call ourselves Indian cuisine, oh. it's actually not an Indian cuisine because oh. the cuisine varies so much. Oh, it varies. We always presume an Indian eats whatever. It's the same all through. Not at all. So, um, so people who know India would mm -hmm. know that every state or every corner of India, mm -hmm. the cuisine changes dramatically, mm -hmm. right? So outside of India, we could still call it an Indian cuisine, but there is still a lot of uh, granularity in the cuisine that you could do when it comes to Indian cuisine. And therefore, I thought to myself that if you are, um, if we are good at Indian food, then what are you best at? And the answer to me was clearly the Punjabi food, which is the Northern Indian food, mm -hmm. is really where we really can excel. Mm -hmm. And that was the thought to, you know, so Dhaba, Cuisine to me is really a subset of Mayura cuisine mm -hmm. and it focuses more on the Punjab, uh, the, Punjab the Northern Indian belt mm -hmm. and and even the taste when you go to Dhaba you'll see, well, for one, uh, you have to keep your calorie count and uh, and other things <laughs> out of the out of the <laughs> restaurant <laughs> because uh, the, the, the Punjabi and the Indian food, yeah. uh, particularly North Indian, yeah. is a rich food, uh, right? You, you go there to... Uh, to enjoy, mm -hmm. to really, uh, uh, you know, salivate on the on the rich, creamy sauces that come along with the food. So, uh, it's a different uh, uh, cuisine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, particularly focused on the North Indian cuisine. Mm -hmm. And of course, the word dhaba mm -hmm. means uh, in India, a roadside eatery. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, uh, when the thought of dhaba came in, uh, the fact is that uh, you realize that when you're traveling on highways, particularly Indian mm -hmm. highways, mm -hmm. the best foods are available on the road, roadside. The mm -hmm. best tasting food is actually available on the roadside. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, we said if that is the case, then we'll combine the two. We'll give the experience of a roadside eatery mm -hmm. with an upmarket ambience. So then we got an actual uh, truck imported and then we have actual tuk-tuks which we converted yeah, into seating yes. and dining areas. <laughs> so you see all those roadside elements yeah. uh, built into the ambience of Tower. Interesting. And there's something very interesting that we're discussing off, uh, off camera before. Your ability of having built a business of Indian cuisine within a country that is not primarily made of Indians. How exactly, how did you, what was it called, how did you find your way around it? I think that is a, uh, that is a good thing mm -hmm. which came by because uh, after having opened the first restaurant, mm -hmm. the realization was clear that Kenyans love Indian food. Mm -hmm. I think that was the uh, basic principle which led us to create other restaurants. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that if you are making a restaurant of a particular cuisine mm -hmm. for the native population of that cuisine, yeah. then you won't go too far. Mm -hmm. So if it was only, let's say for example, our Indian brothers and sisters in Kenya mm -hmm. who would embrace my restaurant but yeah. not the locals, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have gone that far. Mm -hmm. The beauty is that Kenyans uh, love Indian food. Yes, and myself the, included. <laughs> well, I'm sure. But, but you know, the bigger yes. realization yeah. is that Kenyans know mm -hmm. what is a good Indian food and mm -hmm. what is not. True. So therefore, uh, you cannot fool a Kenyan customer. Mm -hmm. He knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. He knows when he's walking into your restaurant. Mm -hmm whether this is the good chi uh, butter chicken mm. or it's not such a good butter chicken. Mm. And I think that is where the, the embracement has come from, uh, uh, from the locals to all our restaurants. And that, that's one big reason for our success. Interesting. Um, for, from someone who's in the corporate life, who's come into the entrepreneurship life and managed to go through the process and now quite successful at it, what are some of the lessons that this particular journey has actually taught you? Oh, many. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether we have time to list all of them. But you can list the top three. <laughs> uh, well, the, 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 the top three, um, you know, lessons uh, is, uh, it might actually sound cliche, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but the fact is that when you start your own business, mm -hmm. uh, you realize that a few things that you just take it as literary sentences and mm -hmm. really don't give much thought to it mm -hmm. are the ones which are the cardinal principles and pillars of your, uh, of your business. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, uh, any book would tell you hard work is the key to success. Mm. No, you ignore that most of the time. Because <laughs> you're really looking for another key. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is mm. that this is true. The fact is that it requires your blood, sweat, uh, toil to be able to build something. And, you know, the. let me compare it with my corporate life. Unless you put the skin in the game, mm. you will not go anywhere. Mm. Unless you get out of your comfort zone, you will mm. not go anywhere. Mm. I could have easily continued with a corporate life which was cushy, which was giving me big fat salary at mm. the end of the month. Mm. And it was easy to do that. Mm. Uh, I could have simply gone back to India and taken up another job. True. Right? But um, now I realize having been you know, in this journey for about 8-10 years mm. that the the gratification and the satisfaction that you create get by creating something of your own is unparalleled mm -hmm. yes you could be a, a, you know, a senior uh, representative in a large company mm -hmm. but then even if you're doing one small shop of yours mm -hmm. the satisfaction and the joy that gives you of creating mm -hmm. is of course unparalleled True. provided mm -hmm. it gives you enough to run your family True. right otherwise it's a struggle yeah, so yeah. Uh, so create businesses which you are you in, are intuitively convinced of, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, you know other things will follow. Uh, as you know, again the the fact is, you know people uh, you would have read so many times in all these management books mm -hmm. that you know uh, uh, chase chase excellence, mm -hmm. you know don't chase money. Mm -hmm. Now it's just a, a standard <laughs> line you know which you read. True. But then when you're doing your businesses, yeah, you realize true. that that is actually the only way to do because if you start focusing on, you know, Money. the revenues mm -hmm. and don't keep your process in check, mm -hmm. then it's not going to happen. But 
if you do your job well mm -hmm. and do all the things that are resulting in customers coming inside your shop and eating at your restaurants mm -hmm. then everything will follow mm -hmm. so you have to focus on the building blocks of where you are get your menu right mm -hmm. get your chefs right get your training right get your service excellence right get your financial jurisprudence right get your you know uh, taxation right mm -hmm. get your books clean mm -hmm. and then the money will follow mm -hmm. but if you start chasing money, money that you know let me open another restaurant and hire these uh, five star chefs from somewhere and 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 things will be okay mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, you'll be disappointed. My goodness, I've really enjoyed this particular conversation. I think time literally flies. That's 42 minutes, literally gone like that. But I've really enjoyed this particular conversation with Mr. Rajiv. So he's the proprietor of Daba Restaurants, Library Restaurant, and the Mayura Restaurant. They're all most of them actually in Westland, right? So at the Sarit Center, there's the Daba Restaurant and the Library Restaurant. At uh, the SGR Terminus, there's the Daba Restaurant. I've eaten there. I've loved it. So thank you so much and I've also loved this particular conversation as always. Hope you've learned a thing or two from this particular conversation. Mostly if you want to open a restaurant business and I'm sure we're going to be having these conversations more and more. As always, we're coming to you from the Capital Club, the place you need to be as an entrepreneur because once you're a part of the Capital Club, there's so many different particular amenities and also something interesting. If you're traveling the world, if you're a global citizen, any particular country, any major city, once you're a part of the Capital Club, you're going to get access to the Capital Club in that particular country. As always, also reminding you on the 4th of April, you're having a masterclass with Michael Joseph at the Nairobi Cinema. I would like to invite all of you. Tickets are only going for 800 shillings just for the aspect to have your availability for this particular exclusive experience. You can get it on madfun.com. My name is Ian Dennis and this has been the Late Night Business. Until next time, see you right here on KTN Home.